Well, we know in humans, humans with a suppressed dopamine level, they will suffer from things like inability to focus or depression, lethargy, possibly socially withdrawn, all of that because of low levels of dopamine. And the same can be seen in our dogs. So dogs that are in physical pain or have endured some chronic stress or have been sick, those dogs, their level of dopamine has been suppressed. Their ability to create a dopamine hit is hampered. And so that's why you take a dog who is not feeling well and you ask them to tug or play a game with you, they're going to be uh, half-hearted or what you'll find is they might play one time, but the first time they fail and you get that negative prediction error, they're tapping out. No, the little dopamine that's there shuts right down. They can't work. I've seen that myself in my youngest dog, this, who's been dealing with a gut issue since the day she was born. And so... I have to be very, very particular about how I train her. In addition, I'm going to share with you that there's nutrition that is involved in dopamine production. So dopamine is relying on the amino acid tyrosine in order to be produced. Now, tyrosine is naturally occurring in a lot of foods, including poultry, chicken, turkey. It's found in bananas, which by the way, also have dopamine in them. Funny thing. I love bananas. Maybe that's why. It's found in pumpkin seeds. My dogs routinely get one and a half teaspoons of ground pumpkin seeds. If you don't grind those pumpkin seeds, you will be visiting them once again on their way out because they do not digest in your dog unless they've been ground. Avocado is another source of tyrosine and you can feed your dog small amounts of avocado. Again, you know, you might want to check with your nutritionist or your veterinarian before you change your dog's diet, but those are things that contribute to the dog's ability to produce dopamine and to produce that dopamine spike. Now, what about if we go on the opposite spectrum, there is such a thing as having too much dopamine. And you will see that I personally believe that that was a struggle that my long gone now dog Buzz struggled with. And Buzz, you may know, I wrote a book about him called Shaping Success. He was an awesome dog, but he was a little bit high, like a lot high. Now he came to me as an eight week old puppy. He never would settle. He was always running around. He was a bit cray cray back then, but Back in 1996, when Buzz came on the scene, I had made a commitment that I wanted to train my dog in obedience and agility without the use of any physical or verbal corrections. I had made that transition with my dog before him, Twister, when she was about two, but this was my first dog from a puppy on up. I was going to do it just all with shaping behavior. Nobody was doing this back then. Nobody was doing it in sports, that's for sure. And so... I was the pioneer making a ton of mistakes. And the biggest mistakes that I made was in my experimental design and how I set up my training environments and how many mistakes Buzzy made. And so what he would do, it wasn't that okay, it must be this, I'm going to try this. And every time he failed, he would get another dopamine hit because he was one step closer to getting it right. And so Buzzy was on such a random schedule of your right that he could get higher and higher and higher. So too much dopamine in the body. And what can happen is that you get frantic behavior, frenetic behavior, the inability to relax, the, oh my gosh, I got to do something. I got to do something. In Buzzy, I always described him as a dog who worked hard and then crashed. And so looking back, I believe he was a dog who maybe had too much dopamine in his body. And one of the things that I do with my own dogs kind of as a detox, as you may know, if you're a listener to this podcast, I love to take my dogs for walks and my dogs, three of them border collies love to run and hurt each other and chase each other. And that goes on for almost the entire walk. Well, at least one day a week, I will have them not do all of that ripping. You're just going to walk and you can sniff and I don't put them on leash, but I tell them with me and they just have calm walks. It's like our dopamine detoxing walk once a week. So you might identify with your dog in one of those two categories. And so you might need to make adjustments one way or the other. But the most important thing I'd like to encourage you to think about is is your training addictive to your dog? Is your dog getting healthy dopamine spikes throughout the training? 
Because if you're training with a food lure, there's a very good chance the first time they get that bite of food, they are going to get excited and get that dopamine hit. But if it's the same food for the rest of your training, it's now neutral. So it's harder for that training to become addictive. And that could be a reason why your dog might not be as addicted to your training as you would like them to be. 